This video is for chapter three of your textbook, which is entitled Race, Ethnicity, and Immigration. And the chapter begins with this story about uh, the twins, Marcia and Millie, who are the twin daughters of Amanda and Michael, uh, a British couple. Um, and these twins are, are, are fairly well known. Um, this is actually the same photo that was uh, on the cover of the National Geographic race episode, uh, or, or not episode, uh, race edition uh, a few years ago. Um, and that's because, you know, Phenotypically, uh, Marcia presents as white and Millie presents as black. They differ in their skin, eye, and hair color. And oftentimes we think about, you know, uh, races as being very different from one another. So the fact that two girls could look so racially different, but not only be part of the same family, but be fraternal twins, I think just kind of strikes at the heart of what a lot of people assume about race, is that the races have all of this genetic difference, when in reality, the genetic difference that exists between races is very small. And in the case of these twins, it's very, very small, um, but yet they look so different. So people will make this false assumption that genetically they must be different. And so your chapter opens up with this example of the twins because the first part of this chapter really is about um, kind of these concepts of race and ethnicity. And it's addressing, uh, you know, how we as sociologists uh, define them and how this sometimes is different than how maybe the common layperson thinks about these terms. Um, so, you know, we can look around us and we can see that human beings have physical differences, you know, in things like height and weight, which we don't necessarily associate with race, but also in things like uh, facial features, skin color, hair texture, um, which are characteristics that in the past we have believed is indicative of different races. Um, and that's because for a very long time, we kind of conflated the, the idea of phenotype, what you look like what we can actually see with genotype, what your genes actually are. And so we assume that because people looked very different that genetically they must be different. Now, uh, in the last 20 or so years, we have had this ability, of course, to map out the human genome. That's been the primary uh, focus of the Human Genome Project. And when we mapped out that human genome, what we, we uh, found uh, was a surprise to some of us, you know, which is that genetically, human beings are nearly identical. Um, and, you know, so there isn't a lot of variation between different humans. Um, and so, you know, we share about 99.9% .9 of our genes with other human beings. And then even that 0.1% difference, less than 0.01% um, actually contributes to what we, we see as racial difference. So we look around and we see people are very different. And we imagine that genetically, um, you know, that that must mean that we're very different, but we're not. Um, and then if we were to then compare the, uh, the genes of people who identify as the same race, race, um, if we compare though them to people who differ, you know, who identify as a different race, what we often find, of course, is that the genetic variation within racial groups is greater than um, the variation between them. So, you know, if we're just looking at it, you know, just the genes and, and the genotype and not the phenotype, we can't necessarily accurately, um, you know, identify people on, on uh, you know, as a specific race. Um, but of course, you know, the concept of race is very old and it certainly predates our ability to do things like map out the human genome. Um, the concept of races seems to have originated in the 18th century um, and a lot of the, the early racial hierarchies made it clear that uh, people wanted to classify and rank groups of people by their outward appearance. Um, and a lot of these uh, racial classifications uh, systems did originate um, from uh, Europeans. Um, and so what we know is that if you look at um, these early classifications and, and the example of the one I give you here is uh, 
uh, Carl Linnaeus is one of our earliest known uh, racial classifications, you can see by how he describes, uh, you know, non-European races, the Americanu, the Afir, the Asiaticus, right? Oftentimes the alleged characteristics he uh, associated with those, those groups of people um, were negative, you know, while the ones he associated with the Europaeus, uh, serious and strong, um, you know, were more positive. And so we know that these racial classifications, which were just, you, you know, just based upon these perceived physical differences, these differences in phenotype, they were also often used to justify racial inequality by suggesting that um, by the laws of nature, some groups of people were superior or better, and therefore they were suited to be, uh, you know, at the top of the hierarchy, while other groups of people were not. Um, and of course, you know, our, all of this is is was just based on these visible characteristics, um, and your your book notes um, that a lot of these traits exist on a continuum. So you know, in, in some ways, it's foolish to even try to sort people into rigid categories based on the way they look, because of the number of people in each group that don't look that dramatically different from one another, right? Um, and so you know, if you're talking about the ambiguous like tan people, um, you know, that can identify as being either, you know, Black or Native American or uh, Latino or Asian uh, or, or even white, you know, there is a solid group of those people and, and it isn't necessarily as easy as like the broad stereotypes that we associate with those groups of people might would make you think uh, to identify folks. And if you want to try your hand at it, um, I give you the link to an activity that I've used in previous face-to-face -face classes where you can kind of sort people um, based on photos and see how many you get right. You know, are you able to accurately uh, racially identify people in such a way that it aligns with their own identification? Um, and all of this, of course, is to suggest, you know, that the biological basis of race, you know, which has been overstated uh, for centuries, uh, you know, as it turns out, it, it doesn't exist, um, you know, that uh, there isn't this, uh, you know, uh, large difference uh, in genes between the different races and the amount of variation within a race is oftentimes greater than the amount of variation between races. But by saying that race is not biologically real, um, is that is that basically saying race isn't real? And this is where as sociologists, it could get a little complicated because, you know, if you consider the Thomas theorem, which is an idea that you, uh, you know, that people, if people define situations as real, they become real in their consequences is, you know, we have spent centuries defining race as being real, and we have enacted laws and policies, we have treated people differently on the basis of race, you know, just because we are now, you know, a couple of decades past the Human Genome Project, and, and we realize that a lot of those assumptions were faulty, you know, does that make race go away, uh, you know, in one generation? Um, and, and the answer, of course, is, you know, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. Because just because race has no biological basis doesn't mean that it doesn't remain socially relevant. Um, it does. Um, and so for this reason, we can talk about both race and ethnicity as being socially constructed. Um, traditionally, of course, you know, we've always thought of ethnicity as being a social construct. But like I said, you know, for a very long uh, period of time, um, we have thought about race as being more biological. And now, of course, we know that in reality, both of them are social constructs. Uh, and both concepts involve self-identification as well as you know, uh, how other people see them as well. So it's not just what you perceive yourself to be, but also you know, what other people perceive you to be also can become meaningful. Um, like any social construction, this can change with time and place. Uh, and when we start talking here in a second about changes to the census, um, you know, I'll, I'll mention some ways in which uh, these definitions, especially in regards to race, have changed over time. So when we think about, you know, this race as a social construction, ethnicity as a social construction, let's start with some definitions and let's clarify how the definitions of race and ethnicity are distinct from uh, the concepts of nationality and nation of origin. Um, uh, which sometimes people will also use uh, as synonyms for uh, race in particular, but they do mean distinct things. So, you know, 
race is basically the idea that people can be grouped, um, you know, on by sharing physical traits um, and that they believe that these shared physical traits have to do with some type of shared descent, right? Uh, you know, that they share some type of, of, of ancestry. Um, but once again, because we're oftentimes just making this uh, basis on on perceived physical traits, um, sometimes that that shared descent, you know, I mean, that's a faulty assumption. And that's why race is not the same thing as just basically, you know, if you want to know where someone comes from, you know, uh, the, in terms of their ancestry, nation of origin is that more accurate term, right? If you want to know like where their, their family descends from, you know, as opposed to asking their race, you should probably be asking about their nation of origin. And then ethnicity is, is the idea that people can be grouped together kind of on the basis of shared cultural traits. Um, and the cultural traits that we most frequently use as the basis of ethnicity are traits like uh, language, uh, religion, um, and to a certain extent, nationality and nation of origin. Um, you know, the idea that you are Irish American, that you are Mexican American, right? That 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 because of your nation of origin, um, that you do share some type of cultural um, inheritance with other people that come from that same nation of origin. Um, nationality is something distinct from all of these, which is of course, um, you know, the nation um, that you uh, you know, were born in, um, that you are a citizen of. Um, uh, and so, you know, if you're talking to someone regardless of their race, um, regardless of their ancestry, um, if they were born here in America, um, you know, their nationality is American. Um, and so just recognizing that all of these, of course, are distinct terms is important. Um, oftentimes, we combine the two primary terms of race and ethnicity to use the term racial ethnic group. You're your textbook calls this a racial ethnicity, um, which I, I I haven't seen that as frequently. Um, so I'm going to go with maybe that's Philip Cohen's, you know, his version of racial ethnic group. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I'm I'm fine with you using either one. So we, if you think about it in in that sense, what we're basically saying is that there are groups of people in our country that we believe like that we believe have uh, kind of uh, a certain amount of shared physical traits. They they look uh, to a certain extent similar. Um, and then they also have some shared cultural elements. Uh, and so this is kind of how we kind of conceive of that racial ethnic group. Um, and, you know, despite the confusion that can come with, you know, defining and measuring race and ethnicity, we still use these terms, we still collect uh, this data, um, because it's useful in a variety of ways. Um, it's how we track uh, diversity, is how we also measure inequality. And so when we are uh, gathering this data, tracking this information, the most common configuration used um, in the United States is the five group racial ethnic configuration. And those five groups are whites, um, non-Hispanic whites is how we oftentimes say it. Uh, Blacks or African-Americans, once again, will often put the word non-Hispanic in front of there. Then of course comes Hispanic Latinos. Uh, and then we have Asians, Native Hawaiians, other Pacific Islanders. Uh, so we group all them together in, in kind of one category. And then we have uh, American Indians, Native Americans, uh, and Alaska Natives. Uh, so this is kind of our, our, our common five group configuration. Um, so if you are filling out a lot of forms, um, you know, uh, whether it's work forms, whether it's forms, you know, related to loan information, whether it's forms related to schools, whether it's maybe even just a survey uh, about your, you know, media preferences. Oftentimes you'll see that the race ethnic uh, uh, options that they give you on the questionnaire usually reflect these five options. So like I said, you know, part of this, uh, you know, information, um, you know, we, we collected in order, of course, to kind of track things related to diversity. Um, and so, and, and to give us a sense of, you know, the, the presence of, of these groups uh, within our country. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, based on um, some uh, information from the federal government. Um, and so from 2016. Uh, and so at this time, the estimate was uh, Americans of European descent, 
um, the group that we oftentimes refer to as white, um, it, we, they were about 61% of, of, of the country at that time. Uh, Latinos were 17%. Uh, African Americans were 13, uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders were 5%, and then Native Americans were 1%. Um, and then people who claimed a combination of two or more of these groups, at that time they accounted for a little over 2.5%. So where specifically do we get these numbers? Do, where do we get these estimates? Um, of course, our best estimates come every 10 years from the census. Um, and so, you know, already, uh, and then we do, and then the government does collect some reports in between, but in terms of an entire population survey, um, that's the census that happens every 10 years. The 2020 census, of course, um, had, a, had a pretty, uh, rocky uh, rollout because, of course, it was during the pandemic, um, but it did happen. Um, and so we can probably expect sometime in, you know, in 2021, um, we'll start to get some uh, reports released by the government uh, reflecting that new data collection and analysis. So a lot of what I'm referencing is based on the uh, 2010 census and its follow-up reports. So it's already a little dated. Um, so this is what the 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 race and ethnicity questions looked like in the 2010 census. Um, we asked about um, Hispanic Latino uh, separately because we treat that as a measured ethnicity, not as a race. Um, and as far as race, we asked specifically about, you know, white, black, um, if you were American Indian or Alaska Native, we ask that you then uh, print your name of your enrolled or principal tribe. Uh, we give several options for Asian um, and Pacific Islander uh, uh, sub-ethnicities. And then we allow people to write some other race. But you know, the idea, of course, is that most people would check one of the boxes and not write in something. Um, and so we use that information, of course, um, in order to understand how much, uh, you know, how how many people in our, our country identify racially as what group. Uh, you know, your textbook has a discussion about the changes of the census over time, and it did give you a look at, you know, what the race question looked like in the 2020 census. Um, you can see that uh, they, they, there was, um, they played around a little bit uh, with the examples provided for whites and blacks and American Indians. Um, and especially for whites, I think, you know, there are some groups uh, that we don't necessarily historically think of as being white, but yes, traditionally we have measured them on the census as being white. And so like, for instance, the Lebanese and, and Egyptians. Um, and so by the government, including them as examples, they're basically trying to send a subtle message to people of those groups like, hey, this is actually the box that we expect you to check, whether this aligns with how you see yourself or not. Um, you can see that we played around with, you know, the primary uh, Asian and Pacific Islander examples that we offer for people to check. And then we have kind of clumped other groups into this other Asian, other Pacific Islander um, kind of pan ethnic group. You might be looking at this and wondering like, hey, I still don't see, you know, my Hispanic and Latino ethnicities. And that's because um, although it, it, it has been a source of controversy, um, we are still measuring Hispanic Latino separately as an ethnicity, um, meaning that they would still need to mark themselves as a race, um, you know, and once again, you know, this doesn't always perfectly align with how people see themselves. You know, people might see themselves as being Hispanic or, you know, they might see themselves as specific being like Mexican American. Um, and, and they think of that as being their racial ethnic group. But on the census, we are then pushing them to then say, I am a white Hispanic, I am a black Hispanic, I am a American Indian Hispanic. Um, and so, you know, this just kind of reflects that any measurement tool is going to have flaws. Um, and especially if you're talking about the census, you know, we have been tinkering around with those categories, particularly our race categories, you know, um, pretty much uh, consistently, uh, you know, since the census first started. Um, and I give you a little table that shows the ways in which we would add and take away um, uh, 
and, and measure differently different categories over time. Um, a, a couple of important changes that I'm just going to highlight here, you know, until 1970, when we allowed people to self identify before that it, the census enumerators would classify people, um, which means that sometimes, especially if someone did not phenotypically, uh, you know, match with how that person perceived their race, they could possibly pop up on the census that year as being, uh, you know, a different race. It's my own grandmother, because she is a, extremely fair with straight hair, um, you know, um, has been marked as white in previous censuses before the 1970 census where people have been allowed to self-identify. Another kind of important change related to identification is it wasn't until the 2000 census that we allowed people to mark uh, more than one race. And, you know, we still don't have the most accurate count of people who consider themselves to be multiracial. Um, in our country, but you know, pre 2000, we really didn't have an accurate account because we were pretty much forcing people to choose one race um, to mark for themselves and their children. Um, which is important um, if you just kind of consider, you know, uh, how that maybe I impacted people who are biracial or consider themselves multiracial. Uh, going back to my previous point about, you know, Hispanics and, and Latinos being an ethnicity category, um, you know, that started in the 1980s. Um, and there are a lot of arguments um, about why uh, we made that decision. But some people say that, you know, it has to do with the fact that there was some hope that, you know, um, for lighter skin um, uh, Hispanic uh, Latino individuals, that they may be um, by marking themselves as white and just with this Hispanic ethnicity that, you know, by their the second and third generation, similar to the Irish and the Italians who weren't originally necessarily seen at, or Greeks, you know, they weren't necessarily seen as being white or readily accepted as being white um, during their kind of early uh, years as immigrants in this country, but eventually now, of course, we, we think about those groups of people as, as just being white. Um, so there was some hope that for fair skinned Hispanics that they would just be absorbed uh, in the larger white population um, and their ethnic, their ethnicity would not mean much more than any other symbolic ethnicity. Um, and we'll talk about later, you know, why that has not necessarily worked out, um, you know, in, in, in the way that, uh, you know, certainly some people thought that it would. Uh, specifically focusing a little bit more about those multiracial individuals. Like I said, we did not allow people to start marking themselves, uh, you know, as, as being of more than one race until the 2000 census. And so um, roughly, you know, it's about 3% of the population um, that identify as such. We know that this is an underrepresentation. We know that people, um, you know, and we knew this even before, you know, Ancestry.com uh, and 23andMe kits became available. Like we know that people, um, you know, have multiracial backgrounds, but a lot of people do not necessarily see themselves as being multiracial. Um, and there are both historical reasons for this and contemporary reasons. You know, historical reasons could relate to policies like anti miscegenation laws, which, you know, made it illegal um, to. Uh, you know, marry and have children with someone of a different race if you were white. Um, and one drop laws that said if you did have a child um, it, and that had any known uh, amount of, of minority uh, ancestry, um, then by that one drop rule that they would be counted as, as being of that minority uh, race. And that's how you have people, for instance, like my grandmother, who, you know, is probably, you you know, less than 20% African American, um, but you know, um, has consistently uh, been seen and and has been, um, you know, uh, tr uh, governed, uh, you know, as 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 black, um, you know, despite the fact that she, if you were just to look at the predominance of ancestry, um, that you know she has more European ancestry, but by one drop laws, you know, that isn't how that was was measured or captured. Um, contemporary reasons, you know. Know, is is the fact that 
you know, uh, for some people, they only mark their predominant race because if they do not have like a close relationship, they, if they haven't built an identity around that other race, then that other race is just kind of symbolic. Um, and it doesn't really, it's not necessarily meaningful or impactful in their life. And therefore they don't think that, you know, they should really measure themselves as being that. Um, and then, uh, you know, and your book kind of touches on this, um, you know, in its discussion of the multiracial population, for a lot of minority groups, they do pressure people, um, you know, there is a pressure to identify with that, that minority race, you know, to not sell out um, by, by, by claiming yourself to be, you know, something um, beyond that race that's seen as a rejection or a betrayal. Um, and although I know a lot of you are probably uh, too young, to remember this, but you know, when Tiger Woods first started to become a big name in, in golfing, you know, he caused a, a bit of an uproar um, by his insistence that he wasn't a black golfer, but he coined the term Cobblin Asian, which combined Caucasian, Black, Indian, and Asian all of the different races and ethnicities that he felt like, you know, comprised his heritage. Um, and there were certainly uh, a good number of people in the African-American community um, that that felt like, you know, that this was wrong. And this was, you know, an example of him trying to distance himself um, from that community. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, you know, there were people that was just like, you know, the country doesn't care about your ancestry. Looking at you, phenotype, is clear. Um, that you are black, that you have some amount of black ancestry, and that's how people are going to see you. And so, you know, a lot of this concern around how do we measure people who are mixed race, it really brings up that um, debate, you know, is race who, you know, how you self identify, or, you know, is an element of race also about how you know, who people perceive you to be, and how they treat you on, on the basis of that identification. Uh, regardless of these controversies, regardless of these debates, what we do know about the racial and ethnic makeup of America is that we are more diverse um, than what we were 20, 30 years ago. And the expectation is that we are just going to continue to become um, even more diverse in the future. And a lot of that does have to do with, if you're looking at, you know, our projection for 2025, our projection for 2050, a lot of it does have to do with, you know, growth, um, particularly particularly in our Latino and Asian American Pacific Islander groups. Um, African Americans are expected to hold steady and uh, uh, non-Hispanic Europeans are expected to decline. Um, and sometimes people look at this and, and, and they think that, that this is largely due to immigration, um, but it's not. A lot of it actually is just due to demographics. Um, the fact of the matter is, is if you are talking about the non-Hispanic white population, uh, a lot of people in this group, their largest kind of age group are the baby boomers who, you know, as much as you love grandma and pop pop and, and whatever, you know, people and, and even though Americans are living longer, you know, we're not vampires, we don't live forever. Um, and so we are going to expect that there are going to be, of course, um, you know, a large number of baby boomers in the next 10 to 15 years are going to pass away. Um, and if you are looking at the birth rate, um, the replacement, uh, you know, rate of, of non-Hispanic Europeans, uh, their family sizes have gotten smaller. So there are going to be more people who, uh, you know, uh, pass away than are born that are part of this group. So that's largely what's driving their shrinking share. That and the fact that, you know, there really is no great reason why a lot of Europeans um, in any real, you know, numbers would choose to immigrate to America. Uh, particularly for, you know, uh, a lot of uh, our Western European nations, their economies are just as strong, if not stronger. Um, you know, they, because they often have uh, a broader safety net for their citizens, you know, the benefits of being a citizen in those countries uh, often surpass the benefits of, of being American. Um, so, you know, that's why we're seeing that, that, that shrinkage from 60% to 57% to a projected 47%. 
Um, even if we dramatically, you know, change immigration policy, it's just worth noting that the story of Latinos is almost the opposite. Um, you know, their largest age groups are under 18 and between 18 and 25. These are groups that in their future, we can expect, um, you know, that they are going to uh, reproduce and have children. Um, and although it is a stereotype that they have, you know, these massively huge families, they do on average have uh, families that are one in some change larger um, than 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 European, uh, you know, white families. So, you know, that is what's driving a lot of that projected increase. With Asian Americans, um, this is actually a group where a lot of their projected change um, is much more closely related to immigration. Um, you know, as people continue to come into this country uh, through, uh, uh, you know, um, through the through school and and work visas, uh, you know, just with the growth of STEM, a lot of that has gone to people that come from these Asian American Pacific Islander countries. Um, and so, once again, uh, and they also, uh, you know, tend to be, uh, you know, younger. Um, as opposed to older. So if they come and on these visas and then they uh, stay and gain citizenship and have families of their own, thus we have an increase of that group. Um, and so, you know, this, all of this, what I'm talking about, of course, is a study of demography. Um, but we don't just collect this data in order to talk about, you know, how America is changing in regards to diversity. We also use this data in sociology to have discussions related to uh, inequality because just because a country is diverse doesn't necessarily mean that we share all of our resources you know even Stevens uh, if anything if you are a sociology major you know that uh, it is a primary focus within our discipline, um, you know, social stratification. We're interested in the structured ways in which society is arranged so that some groups have better access uh, to society's resources. And so, you know, specifically that group we refer to as the majority group. Now, it's important to note that the majority group does not necessarily need to be the numerical majority. It really is just meant to say that this is a group that is advantaged in respect to other groups in terms of social status, education, employment, wealth, political power. With social status, sometimes the way we talk about this is privilege, right? That they enjoy privileges, unearned privileges, uh, in a variety of settings. Um, and so, you know, what it means to say that their advantage is me, mean, it means that they receive more in these resources than, you know, the, than numerically what, what, what it would be uh, suggested that they are due. So for instance, um, for something like, you know, political power, uh, if non-Hispanic whites are 60% of the population, then, their proportionate share of political power positions would be 60%. Instead, you know, if you're thinking about it, particularly at the state and at the, the national level, you know, it's well over, uh, you know, uh, in the high 80s, low 90s uh, percent of those positions, um, you know, that they have. So that's what it means to say that they're advantaged. Um, same thing with like education, right? So if they earn 60% of the baccalaureate degrees, if they earn 60% percent of the of you know the doctoral and professional degrees then we would say they're earning their proportional share when they earn significantly more than that we now say they say that they are advantage um and so another way if it really just trips you up um, that the majority group doesn't have to be the numerical majority you can substitute the word majority group with dominant group the reason why i like the word or i prefer the term majority group versus uh dominant group is because the opposite of majority group is minority groups which i'm about to talk about in the next slide while the opposite of dominant group is subordinate group and for me personally i just don't like i just don't like referring to groups as subordinate um i'm more comfortable with the majority minority language but like i said if you get tripped up on the idea that a group doesn't have to be the numerical majority in order to be the majority, then it might would be helpful to you to use the terminology uh, dominant and subordinate. 
A good example historically, of course, of a group that was the majority, even though they were never the numerical majority, is if you think back to the apartheid system in South Africa, where the white Afrikaners um, were never the, the were never the numerical majority, but certainly were the majority group in terms of the fact that the entire apartheid system was set up for their benefit, and it drastically disadvantaged. Um, the the Af the the native uh, Africans um, who were the numerical majority, but were very much disadvantaged in regards to resources. Um, so before we talk about minority groups, uh, just briefly a little bit more about the majority group. Um, so. Uh, it's worth noting that white groups in the United States have traditionally not enforced strict boundaries in regards to intermarriage um, as long as the person that you're marrying is another white sub-ethnicity. Um, so, you know, this is why oftentimes if an Italian American marries an Irish American, they don't talk about themselves as being biracial because they both share the race of white. Um, and, you know, the fact that they have different ethnic backgrounds, you know, that they have different nations of origin, this hasn't traditionally been that uh, big of a deal in our country. Um, and it has become decreasingly less of a big deal post 1960s. Um, and so this is kind of why if you talk to kind of the average non Hispanic white individual, sometimes they might have a kind of uh, strong ethnic identity like you know, my family is is three generations Greek. Um, but oftentimes they don't they maybe just have a very kind of uh, shaky understanding of 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 where their people came from. And a lot of that is because for most parts of our country's history, there hasn't been a lot of targeted prejudice and discrimination against most white sub ethnicities right the probably only uh, the only two outliers to this would probably be groups like um, uh, uh, the Irish. Uh, the Italians, and then of course you do have the Jews who racially are seen as white, but culturally, uh, ethnically are seen as something different because of, of religion and the anti-Semitism that comes with that. Um, but for a lot of, of white uh, ethnic groups, um, that racial designation of white just kind of trumped any uh, ethnic differences that they, they had once they were here in America, especially once they were no longer first generation immigrants and you know and they were actually second third generation Americans and so this is different than minorities who a lot of minority groups they have experienced a pattern of disadvantage or inequality keyword there being pattern right so it wasn't just one person you know shouting something at them it wasn't just you know one person not wanting to hire someone like them it's the idea that they have experienced multiple uh you know occasions of this disadvantage and a lot of this uh, is related to the role of prejudice and discrimination, right? Prejudice being, you know, the attitudes and, and, and the beliefs um, that a group is uh, inferior um, or in some ways uh, uh, less respected, less worthy of respect than your own. And discrimination, of course, being the actions where you treat someone uh, unequally uh, due to a characteristic that really should have nothing uh, to do uh, with whatever the, 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 the case is, right? Um, so, you know, it is discrimination to say, we aren't going to, you know, I'm not gonna allow this person into the gifted program because they are Latino versus I'm not gonna allow this person into the gifted program because they have low test scores. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, dis it's discrimination if you're treating someone a different way on the basis of a characteristic that shouldn't matter. Minority groups oftentimes share a visible trait or characteristic is what allows us to to, you know, differentiate them, to distinguish them from the larger group. Um, and because of this, like this, this pattern of disadvantage, uh, because of this uh, perceived visible difference, oftentimes they are a self-conscious social unit, meaning they think of themselves as being something different and separate from the dominant group. Um, they see themselves in, in, in that way. Um, oftentimes, uh, this is an ascribed status. 
uh, like, you know, so it's the idea that you are born your race and you will die your race, that this isn't something that you can change. It's not an achieved status. Um, and, and there is this, uh, you know, tendency to marry within the group. And so uh, your book talks about this in regards to endogamy versus exogamy. Um, and sometimes this tendency is due to internal pressure of the group to marry one of your own kind. But certainly in America, we often, we will consider Consider the fact that this has also been related to policies that has forced people to marry people or has prevented people from marrying outside of their group. So if you're looking at, you know, and, th and this is why I said, you know, it can be complicated uh, to think about the word majority as being a numerical majority because there are parts of the country where the minority uh, groups outnumber the majority group in terms of uh, in terms of actual numbers, and so you can see that you know the states that have the highest percentage of minority groups, you know, uh, unsurprisingly, Hawaii, California, New Mexico, Texas, all of those groups are right up there. Um, but then there are you know states that have a very low uh, average of minority groups. For instance, Maine, Vermont, West Virginia, um, and so. All of this, and this is just another map that's just kind of looking, you know, provides you this data at the county level, um, as well as like emphasizes, you know, by the county, you know, uh, what is the majority, uh, what is the majority group when it is not in fact non-Hispanic whites. And so unsurprisingly, you know, you see a lot of counties in California, New Mexico, Arizona, um, and uh, the southwestern part of Texas, uh, where it's Hispanic. Um, and then of course, Hawaii, you know, the Pacific Islander, native Hawaiian. Um, and then you can see some counties, uh, for instance, in the south where it's, it's black. Um, and then, and, and then of course, all the, the counties that are in gray, these are counties where um, the majority group is, is non-Hispanic white. And so, you know, why are we talking about this, you know, uh, in regards to, to families? Um, and, and that's because part of the growing diversity, and this is straight from your textbook, part of the growing diversity in family structure has coincided with rapidly expanding diversity in the racial ethnic composition of the United States. Um, and, and that's because some family types are more common, more likely among racial minorities than other groups. Um, specifically, you know, your book talks about, you know, some of this has, has been uh, uh, due to immigration, uh, uh, changes in immigration, um, and some of this has been due to, uh, you know, just demography, uh, changes in birth rates, once again, particularly among immigrant uh, and second generation immigrant groups. Um, and, and, and so with this comes shifts in family structure. And so this brings us to the kind of second part of your, of your chapter. Um, and this is a quote straight from that chapter. Uh, the history related in chapter two is, or is one of the growing individual independence as a feature of modernity. But for many members of minority groups, the struggle for collective autonomy and self-determination remains a dominant theme in family life. Therefore, we need to pay attention to the larger social issues affecting each race and ethnic group. So what this quote is basically saying is if you're looking at the majority group, non-Hispanic whites, modernity, as we learned in chapter two, um, you know, over time, this has made the family form uh, more individuated, um, you know, more flexible, that family independence and, and how you organize and live your family lives um, has become more individuated, uh, particularly uh, for that dominant group. Um, but because of the history of, of racial uh, inequality uh, in our country, that if you're talking about the families of minority groups, um, you know, not to say that they also aren't aren't interested in, uh, you know, individuating their family form and family structure. Um, there is still this focus on on the collective, and there is a focus on, you know, how social forces impact the larger collective, and then how this then trickles down into the family itself. And so that's why we're going to be focusing on this section um, primarily on just our major, uh, you know, our four major minority. 
groups, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Latinos, and Asian American Pacific Islanders. All right, I took a pause there, but um, I'm back and we're going to begin, like I said, with uh, Native Americans. And so I'm not going to read all of this because you can read it for yourself. Um, but the big takeaway here is that, you know, we don't have a precise number of, of how many um, individuals uh, that were Native American, you know, how many of them were here before the arrival of, of Europeans, but certainly archaeologists, um, anthropologists suggest a lot, um, you know, upwards of 20 million. Um, and very quickly, uh, this number was reduced um, because by 1800, it was now less than 600,000. And so a lot of this uh, diminishing, you know, it has to do with the fact there was, you know, the loss of land, has to do with warfare, um, you know, it has to do with uh, disease, uh, both the intentional and unintentional spread of diseases like smallpox. Um, and it's worth noting that as their number became smaller, um, Native American tribes became even, uh, you know, more vulnerable to the encroachment of, of, of the uh, new American people. Um, and so as American society, you know, began to spread, you know, beyond those original 13 uh, colonies that became 13 states, you know, it meant that they pushed Native Americans even uh, you know, further, uh, you know, to the outskirts of society and to extinction. Um, so by the time we hit 1830, where we had the Indian Removal Act, which resulted in, you know, the forced, uh, you know, um, the forced expulsion of Native Americans out of, uh, out, you know, off of the lands and, and, and replacing them uh, onto uh, plots of land in, uh, you know, the mountain and in, in the, the mountain area in the, the, the Midwest. Um, and on the reservation system, um, you know, so we have this happening um, and and we created Indian boarding schools where there was this forced assimilation uh, where we forced Native American children, um, we took them away from their, their families um, and we forced them to kind of give up their kind of native cultures, their language, their religion, um, you know, we Christianized them, um, we made them cut their hair, we made them wear Western clothing, um, you know, so we have both a, a genocide and a cultural genocide going on. And so by the time it's the end of the Civil War, so now we're in the 1860s, that 600,000 was now 350,000. Um, and by 1870s, um, the number is even smaller. And so as we kind of, you know, near the end of the 1800s, it's less than 250,000. Um, so in the span of a couple of centuries, we've gone from 20 million people um, to, you know, that were spread throughout, uh, you know, throughout the nation in their own individual individuated tribes. They didn't think about themselves as being like some cohesive, uh, you know, identity. You know, we're now talking about less than 250,000 thousand people almost all of them are primarily subdued and on reservations um and and you know uh what has been the lasting impact of that so you know we talked about in a lot in 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 the previous chapter when we were talking about the early american history that there is so much variety and diversity among Native American, uh, you know, tribes. You know, we don't want to paint with too broad of a of of a of a stroke here about you know what families were like. Uh, for these groups, um, but some kind of common themes do come out of of study of these of of these groups, and you know, things like cooperation over competition the well-being of the collective over uh, that of the individual. Um, you know, all those, these tribes were not, you know, they did not, you know, uh, have this Western Judeo-Christianity as their primary religion. They weren't non-spiritual. Uh, almost all of them had a spiritual orientation. So they had their own kind of native, uh, you know, spirituality. Um, that who they considered to be family, um, you know, was often uh, drawn more broadly. Um, there wasn't this uh, as close focus on the nuclear family uh, of the of this group compared to, uh, you know, our European uh, white settlers. Uh, 
I, I discussed this before, but, you know, there seemed to be greater tolerance around same sex, uh, you know, relationships, uh, as well as transgender uh, identity. Um, some groups even practice polygamy. Uh, you know, so they were different. Um, you know, the family life was distinctly different. Um, now, of course, when we talk about the American Indian population, um, things that, you know, are going to impact their ability to form families, uh, a lot of the, the socioeconomic factors aren't good. Um, you know, uh, for the Native Americans who have remained uh, on reservations, which are often in rural areas located far from economic opportunity, um, you know, the, the American Indians that remain in on those reservations, you know, they face problems due to poverty um, uh, and, 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 and that pop up in, in health uh, issues like obesity, um, alcoholism, uh, suicide rates and mental health uh, issues. Um, there are oftentimes issues uh, related to family violence, um, violence against uh, children, but also high rates of um, interpersonal violence, violence against women. Uh, the reservations have uh, oftentimes very high unemployment rates, um, and there aren't a lot of opportunities for people who get college degrees, so uh, uh, educational attainment is rather low. Now, of course, a lot of Native Americans who uh, do want upward mobility, um, you know, who do go off and get college degrees, a lot of them then, of course, leave the reservation. Um, and then it becomes harder, uh, you know, for uh, us as social sciences to track, uh, you know, because we have a hard time distinguishing once you're no longer on the reservation, you know, are you someone who, you know, is is principally enrolled in a tribe, you know, or are you someone who on the census, when you say you're Native American, you're just kind of claiming an identity on the basis of what you know, a rumor said your grandma was like part Cherokee or Choctaw or something. Um, for some reservations, the gambling industry has made a difference. It has provided a flow of income, but it's worth noting that, you know, the reservations that have uh, most benefited uh, from uh, setting up, you know, casinos are the reservations that are located, um, you know, uh, you know, on routes that have, you know, a high number of, 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 of people traveling over that route or reservations that are located outside of, a, you know, a good sized city. Um, and so that's certainly not all reservations. And once again, although we might think about Native Americans as this, you know, unified entity, you know, oftentimes they still think of themselves as individuated tribes. So one tribe doing well uh, because of the gambling industry um, does not mean that they then share that wealth with other reservations and other tribes um, that perhaps are financially struggling. One issue that we see with this minority group that we don't necessarily see with other groups is the fact that oftentimes people do not think about Native Americans as, ex you know, as existing as real people in contemporary times. You know, people who, you know, this is their race, um, you know, this is their ethnicity, but otherwise they're just like us. You know, we still in, in our heads might think about them as these mythical representations kind of based on what we've seen, you know, in the movies, you know, um, The Last of the Mohicans, you know, cartoon Tune movies, you know, like Pocahontas or, you know, uh, the uh, American Indians that were in Peter Pan, you know, it's worth noting the fact that, you know, we still have these controversies about, you know, them being uh, 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 mascots um, and, 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 and for sports teams, you know, this isn't something that comes up uh, when we talk about other uh, minority groups who, um, you know, uh, might face or, you know, not might, but definitely have faced their own uh, kind of issues uh, in regards to prejudice and discrimination. But admittedly, if you're talking about a Black person, if you're talking about an uh, Asian American person, if you're talking about a Hispanic person, you know, we do think of those people as real real people that live in 2021, um, which is sometimes more than what we can say when you ask a person about a person of Native American uh, heritage. Uh, and so, you know, this idea about, you know, how do we handle this when there's this group that literally is dying out, you know, what does this mean for things like 
adopting a child. Um, you know, so I assigned you this New York Times article about who can adopt a Native American child because it brings up the utility of a, a old policy that we've had in America, um, the Indian Child Welfare Act. So I wanted you to read that article so you can kind of consider, you know, to what extent, um, you know, uh, does this represent um, uh, intersection between the state and family arenas? Uh, and do you think that a law like this is still necessary? Moving to our second minority group, which are African Americans. Once again, um, you got some background information about um, slavery and families under the slave system uh, in the previous chapter. So I'm not going to go back over that material. Uh, you know, new material that comes out is, is, is you know, a, a focus on what happened post slavery. Um, and so, you know, post slavery, uh, as African Americans are now no longer slaves and and they're forming families, and especially as they're in some cases leaving the South, which we'll talk about more in an upcoming slide, but they're leaving the South to form families. Um, what we see is a proliferation of a female headed family structure um, that is a stark contrast to the nuclear family that we see in most white families. Um, and there was a report written by Daniel Patrick Moynihan called the Moynihan Report, um, which, you know, went pretty hard on these female headed households. Um, and it kind of said that, you know, the reason why African Americans uh, are struggling with poverty and they're not going to be able to get ahead is because they have these households that instead of being headed by a man and led by a married couple, you know, they're headed by, uh, you know, a woman. And, you know, Moynihan, of course, did not contextually, you know, consider, you know, why are there so many households headed by women? Um, um, that, you know, and why is this family structure more common among African Americans um, than, you know, than, than white uh, non-Hispanic families. Um, and, you know, Du Bois, who studied this, you know, he kind of like took a step back and considered the socio-historical context and was like, look, you have the oppression of slavery, which separated families um, and, you know, and, and in some cases, you know, resulted in a, uh, you know, a gender disparity, uh, the number of men uh, versus the number of women, um, and, 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 and as well as just kind of establishing the fact that unlike white women, African American women were expected to work, expected to contribute, um, you know, to the welfare of their household. And then when, you know, African Americans left the South and they moved into, uh, these areas um, in in the Midwest and the Northeast, you know, because of lack of economic opportunity for African American men, that also kind of hindered their ability to be able to serve as the head of household uh, the way that. Um, the way that white men uh, could, um, and 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 because historically they had this tradition of of women, African American women working outside of the home, uh, these women were much more quick and much more apt to take up the slack and to work outside the home than you know uh, even poor white households were, um, and and this was of course out of necessity because this is how the only way that they could keep their families out of poverty. Um, so this strategy, you know, that Moynihan kind of disparaged was later seen by a lot of scholars as being resilient and adaptive, right? It wasn't so much that they rejected, you know, marriage and rejected setting up these households, but it was more like, you know, the larger structure made these households some something akin to unlikely to straight up impossible. Uh, and, you know, what would have been the alternative, you know, to let their family starve, to just not form families at all? Um, and, and certainly, at least if you're thinking about it in terms of attitudes and beliefs, you know, research has shown that, you know, they, Black Americans often upheld the separate Sears model, like, you know, it sounded great to them, they weren't rejecting it, it's just they weren't necessarily able to put it into practice. Uh, because of those uh, socioeconomic, uh, you know, forces uh, that I noted. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of this, of course, was playing out uh, at a time of kind of a larger, you know, upheavals that were, were that were going on um, in, in larger society. Uh, because what we did see, um, you know, during the, the time period of the early 1900s to mid 1900s, 
was, you know, a shift of, of African Americans from the South into the North. Um, and it's called the Great Migration. And there were push versus pull factors going on here. Push factors, meaning the things pushing them out of the South. Well, you know, after a very brief period of time, Reconstruction, uh, you know, the South um, then enacted a series of uh, laws that pretty much encoded um, uh, racial segregation um, and, and kind of so it, it made discrimination legal. And that's actually what we call it de jure, um, you know, de jure uh, segregation. Um, and we call this period of time Jim Crow. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of ways, Jim Crow was, was not too much uh, better than slavery. Um, and, and it lasted for a long period of time. It lasted from, you know, the early 1900s until the 1960s uh, in a lot of parts of the South. And these laws were enforced, you know, not just by, you know, imprisonment and fines, but by violence. Um, this is where we first see the rise of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Um, we see a uh, unbelievable number of lynchings. So what we call extrajudicial uh, um, uh, violence. So, you know, basically lynch mobs uh, enacting their own form of violence um, outside of the judicial system. And so all of this was kind of pushing African Americans um, and their families out of the South. And what was pulling them to the North was, of course, this is the Industrial Revolution. We have the rise of the factory system. And, uh, you know, in the factory system, you know, there is the ability to get work uh, that pays pretty well. Um, and uh, even if you don't have, you know, uh, education. Um, and, you know, when they get to the North, what they find is, is you know, prejudice and discrimination does still await them there, um, even though it's not necessarily the de jure segregation um, that existed in the South, what they have now is de facto uh, segregation and discrimination, uh, where oftentimes uh, African Americans found themselves to be, you know, last hired, first fired, a lot of communities, you know, did not want um, you know, African Americans living in those communities. So they wound up living in highly segregated areas that then kind of found themselves uh, impoverished and lacking in resources. Uh, and, and so this is kind of, you know, um, so, so the, the social forces that impacted their ability to form a kind of uh, nuclear family modeled after the white middle class, it was hindered in the South, but it was also hindered in, in the North as well. And so what has happened today is that, you know, um, there is a very highly visible black uh, middle class. Um, and you, you obviously, you know, you have black uh, individuals that are, you know, entering all types of professions. Uh, African American uh, women have some of the highest rates of post secondary educational attainment. Um, but at the same time, you also have African, the African Americans are also the, you know, they have the highest poverty rate of any um, major racial ethnic group. It leads to a concept, um, you know, that in sociology we refer to as the two Black Americas, that there is this distinct class divide in the Black community. There are African Americans that were able to take advantage of uh, educational and economic opportunities that arose out of the civil rights movement, um, and they were able to position their families, um, you know, to kind of be on this kind of pathway to middle class nobility and, and success. But, you know, similar to Reconstruction, a lot of that um, a lot of those opportunities that came out of the civil rights movement, uh, quickly there, there, there was a pretty strong backlash to a lot of those types of programs. And so some African Americans, a good number of African Americans were not able to take advantage of those same opportunities. Um, and especially for those that found themselves in these kind of urban, urban centers, what happened is that, you know, as globalization and deindustrialization happened, um, there is just not a lot of economic opportunity uh, left in those areas. So if you do not have the ability to, you know, earn an education, move away, um, and you're kind of left in these cities like, you know, Detroit, Chicago, and you're kind of left behind, instead of having these pretty well-paid blue-collar jobs that you can 
work and you know earn a living wage at, what's been left behind is either poorly paid service jobs or possibly even no work at all. Um, and so, you know, the story of, of African Americans is literally almost the story of two distinct communities. Um, you know, one community that is like slowly but on track to, uh, you know, achieving this middle class mobility and success. And in, in, in a, more of those families, you know, you do see that kind of nuclear family structure. And then you have uh, the other Black. Uh, community where um, they are in areas that are largely, uh, you know, deprived of much economic opportunity. Um, and in terms of family structure, uh, as opposed to that kind of nuclear family structure that we promote, um, you know, it, it, those fa the families there are more likely to be single mother uh, households. And so your book has this whole interesting kind of section about, you know, why do these single mother households, you know, why do they predominate in the African American community, uh, you know, what is it, 150 years, you know, after the end of slavery. Um, and it has, and, and Cohen paints the picture of a lot of factors here, um, that there is higher rates of joblessness among African Americans. Um, Black men have a higher uh, mortality rate. Um, they have a higher incarceration rate. Um, and it's not even just as easy as like, oh, well, why don't you marry outside of your race? Because it's worth noting, most people do still marry within their race. But then if you look at the numbers of people marrying outside of their race, African American women have some of the lowest exogamy, uh, you know, rates, like they have the lowest rates of racial intermarriage. And so what happens is, is they find themselves unmarried. There are so many single black women. Um, and to what extent then, you know, are, are, do people then just make the decision to be single and childless versus making the decision to be single uh, and, and a parent? Um, you know, uh, you know, that's one of those examples of what we mean when we say that according to modernity theory, people are making their own individuated choices, um, you know, kind of based on, you know, what they what they want um, for their own personal fulfillment. So I think this is important because what it suggests isn't necessarily that, you know, black women don't want to marry. Um, and it, it, it so much as it suggests that there are certainly not enough uh, black men for eligible black women to marry. Um, and, and therefore, whether or not they're the consequential decision of I never got married, does that mean that I'm never going to have children, you know, that becomes something that they have to individually consider. Um, recent research that kind of complicates this whole, you know, is it necessary to have a two parent household um, to raise, you know, a, a, to raise a child successfully, you know, uh, is is brought up by this piece that I had you read um, called The Myth of the Two-Parent Home. Um, and so Cross, uh, who is an academic, uh, you know, she is talking about her research that kind of shows that, you uh, maybe um, the presence of two parents in the home isn't as necessary among African American communities where historically there's been less of this nuclear family model um, than when compared to other racial ethnic groups where if you're raised in a single parent home, maybe it's more likely to be stigmatizing, it's more likely to be problematic because those groups don't have that same history with that type of family structure. Which brings me now to my third group, which are uh, Latinos. Um, and so this, they are the largest minority group in the country. Um, and, you know, it's, it's always important to note that while some Latino families have been in the country for many generations, um, a, a, a larger number are relatively recent immigrants. And so we talk about this group and you kind of have to acknowledge, you know, this distinction between, you know, are they a colonized group? Are they an immigrant group? Um, and even if you just focus solely on Mexican, Mexican Americans, there's still this divide of colonized group versus immigrant group. Um, and so we're going to talk uh, about the amount of diversity that exists within the Latino culture by kind of briefly focusing on, you know, uh, the three primary groups. Um, 
Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Cuban Americans. So the Mexican War of Independence, 1810 to 1821, um, they were fighting for independence from Spain. It was a very hard fought war. Um, they suffered a lot of casualties, but they were ultimately successful. Well, just, you know, a couple of, you know, a short period of time later is when they finally are free of, of Spain, um, the United States basically annexed and occupied Texas. Um, some, some American settlers just pretty much uh, settled in part of Texas and said, you know what, this should be part of America. Uh, and as opposed to the American government saying like, hey, no, that's Mexico's land, you all need to move. The American government was like, hey, no, we got your back. We're willing to go to war over this. And so, you know, they, they fought this war um, and I think it's probably a testament, you know, uh, to the Mexican army, you know, how hard they fought this war, given the fact that they hadn't really even fully recovered from their own war of independence. So they, they very closely fought the uh, uh, Americans. Um, and, and so it was a hard fought war on both sides. And ultimately, uh, as America was starting to get the, the upper hand, the president of Mexico at the time agreed to this treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And it had a lot of terms, um, you know, part of which, you know, America agreed that they weren't going to seize the entirety of Mexico. Instead, uh, you know, Mexico was going to give them lands in the Southwest, uh, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, the Southern part of California. They were gonna give those lands to America. Uh, the caveat was that, you know, the, the Mexican families who were living on those lands at the time, um, you know, on farms, on ranches, you know, the, in the treaty, they were supposed to be allowed to remain um, and that they could seek out citizenship in America, but they were not necessarily be required to become American citizens in order to keep their land. Um, and so this is why I say there is this history of there being colonized Mexican Americans. Um, now, from that period on, there has then been this tension between America and Mexico um, and the Mexican, the regular everyday Mexican, Mexican Americans that kind of get caught up, um, you know, in both of these nations, you know, politicking and policies because America kind of defaulted uh, on that treaty um, almost right away, you know, that they would, you know, basically try to starve uh, and force uh, these farms and ranches to go out, to go under, you know, they would take their land sometimes by force. Um, there, you know, I talked about lynching before in regards to African Americans, but it's worth noting that at this period of time, you know, if you look specifically at states like Texas and, and Arizona, New Mexico, there's also a, 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 a pretty sizable amount of violence directed towards Mexican, Mexican Americans, um, you know, as a way of forcing them out, um, forcing them off of their home and land and back to Mexico. Um, and this was escalated, you know, in the 1930s uh, during uh, what we call repatriation, uh, where basically FDR, um, you know, who we hold up um, as admirable in so many ways, but certainly one non-admirable thing that he did um, was, you know, he, he uh, during the, the, the fallout of the Great Depression, he was like, you know, I, 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 I have to be focused on, uh, you know, American uh, citizens, white American citizens, and there's really no easy way to round up and get rid of African American citizens. But what we can do is we can get rid of our Hispanic citizens. Um, and so basically, um, Mexican Americans were sent back to Mexico. And it's worth noting that, you know, what we now know um, is that a lot of them were in fact Mexican American. They were uh, people of Mexican uh, descent who were born here in America, but they would get these notices and usually at the threat of violence, um, you know, they would tell to leave their lives in America behind and go back to um, and go back to Mexico. And so that's just an example of one policy that kind of was part of this circular migration um, that exists between Mexico and America that exists even still till today. You can talk about, um, you know, the post-World War II Bracero program. You can talk about Operation Wetback. You can talk about NAFTA. Uh, but in general, we have had, um, we have had multiple policies that have kind of contributed to uh, this back and forth um, migratory pattern that we see in, in the Mexican-American population. 
Puerto Ricans are a little different. Um, and that's because Puerto Rico is a uh, territory of the United States. You know, it's, it's, it, it, we, we gained that territory um, after the Spanish-American War of 1898. Um, and although we extended citizenship to Puerto Rican uh, citizens uh, in 1917, um, we did not in fact make Puerto Rico a state. So Puerto Rico, they are citizens of the United States, um, but because Puerto Rico itself is not a state, it does lead to like some kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated, you know, what does it mean for them to be a citizen? Um, and so uh, if you're interested in that, I suggest you kind of check out that uh, article that I provided. Um, but that means, of course, that their kind of immigration uh, patterns are different than other, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hispanic Latino groups, because instead of it being like you're moving from one country to another country and there are all these special laws in place, it's kind of like if you migrated, you know, like I did from North Carolina to California, there are a lot less lo laws in place. And so unsurprisingly, there is this continual circular migration between the island of Puerto Rico and mainland United States. Um, unemployment and poverty is an issue on the prop on the island. And so, you know, that's the push factor and the pull factor, particularly in, you know, World War II era, were the labor shortages. Um, so there was factory work that could be gained. And so that's prob that is why that, you know, the largest Puerto Rican um, populations exist in these northeastern cities because they were going they were moving there to work in that uh, urban labor market. And then my final kind of Hispanic group to focus on are my Cuban Americans. Um, and so they are uh, one of the most spatially concentrated minority groups in the United States um, with 67% of, of the population being in Florida and 52% being in, in just Miami. Um, and they have a unique history because the first mass immigration came fairly late in the 1950s. And it was because of the Marxist revolution that brought Castro to power. Now, if a Marxist um, uh, communist, uh, you know, comes to power, uh, you know, who would be the first people that would probably leave? Uh, well, if you're thinking about wealth distribution, wealth, uh, you know, redistribution policies, it's probably the wealthy that are going to want to get out of there um, and take as much of their resources with them. And so the first immigrants from Cuba to the America, they were the elite classes, you know, they were educated, they were financially well off, and they enjoyed um, close political ties with the United States. So the United States welcomed them as political refugees, and it gave them resources to basically establish a base in Florida, because they thought that would be a good place that they could launch a counter revolution against Castro. And immigration from Cuba to Florida continued for decades after, but by the 1980s, um, you know, those immigrants were now, uh, well, they were less likely to be wealthy, they were less likely to be politically collected. Uh, connected or welcome. And phenotypically, they were more likely now to be darker. Um, you know, the other thing about a lot of the wealthier Cubans that moved in that first wave is they were fair skin. Um, they were what we would consider to be, you know, white uh, Hispanics. And the later waves were now poorer and darker. Um, but it's worth noting that, you know, um, that early start of having immigrants who were financially well off and then were given resources by the country to establish, you know, homes and businesses, uh, you know, it is reflected when you look at the SES of uh, the Cuban American uh, subgroup. Um, they are in terms of educational attainment, in terms of political power, in terms of uh, home and small business ownership, they are doing very well. And certainly if you leave them in the larger Hispanic Latino population and you look at SES factors, it sometimes can give a, a, a rosier than reality depiction of the typical SES uh, uh, background um, of, you know, a non-Cuban American.
so because there's so much, you know, culture, you know, for there, there are all these different Latino cultures, and I've only highlighted three of many, um, you know, that does mean that there's a lot of diversity. Um, certainly the more recent uh, 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 Latino immigrants have come from Central America, and they are, re you are largely refugees, and, you know, they're driven, as your textbook says, by economic crises, violence, and natural disasters. So they are in a much, you know, worse uh, situation um, than, than immigrants that, you know, came previously. Um, but one important takeaway is that because there's this continuing flow of immigrants um, from these Latino cultures, you know, this does mean that there is cultural continuity uh, among Latinos or, you know, cultural rejuvenation. Um, and so as opposed to what we saw with like the, you know, early waves of Irish Americans, Italian Americans, Greek Americans, part of what Americanized them was the fact that there wasn't this ongoing cultural rejuvenation. Um, and that's one thing that perhaps might keep ethnic identity among Latinos strong in a way that we did not foresee. If we focus more closely on just families, um, you know, a concept that your textbook introduces is familiarism, uh, which is a personal outlook that puts family obligations first before individual well-being. And that's not to say that this outlook doesn't exist among other, other groups, but maybe not to the same extent as we see among Latinos, um, as well as maybe some Asian sub-ethnicities. Um, and one way we can see that reflected is the fact that Latinos are two to three times more likely to live in extended families than most other groups. Um, they're also more likely to live within close proximity of other family members than other groups. Um, and so just playing on that idea of familiarism, um, I suggested this article, or I, I didn't suggest it, I'm requiring this article, uh, which kind of contextualizes that with what's going on now in terms of pandemic safety, you know, and, and I'm encouraging you to think not just in regards to pandemic safety, uh, you know, which makes it clear the disadvantages that familiarism can, can pose. But I want you to just think in general, in what ways can familiarism be both a strength, um, but also perhaps a hindrance uh, in, in the lives of, of, uh, of an, a Latino individual. Bringing me now to uh, my final minority group that I'm gonna focus on, Asian Americans. Um, Similar to Latinos, this is another group that we consider a pan-ethnicity, meaning it's a large, it's a, it's a broad label for a group that's comprised of uh, many smaller groups. Um, and this is a group that has grown dramatically in recent decades. And a lot of that growth has been linked to immigration, as I mentioned previously, um, the role of work and education visas, allowing people to kind of establish a life here in America where they can then um, bring over additional family members through a process we call chain immigration. And so although um, Asian Americans are comprised of multiple set of ethnicities, the uh, three largest are China, India, and uh, Philippines or Filipino. Um, because um, a, a, a large number of these families do include immigrants, um, this is actually the group that has, you know, the largest percentage of people who speak a language other than English at home. Um, early American history in the United States, um, I talked bo uh, before last time about um, Chinese Americans, and I'm going to add a little bit more here. Uh, in regards to that, as well as address Japanese Americans. As I noted in a previous video, you know, the Chinese uh, immigrants uh, came over, they were largely young men, and they were coming over to work um, in mining and on railroads and in the areas, uh, you know, that were set up around, you know, mining and, and, and railroad industries. Um, Native born workers, um, they felt threatened uh, by the Chinese um, and they uh, pressured uh, politicians to pass uh, and support the Chinese Exclusion Act, which uh, was put into place in 1882 and it basically banned Chinese immigration and it remained in effect until World War II. And so going along with that, the fact that there also were anti-miscegenation laws that prevented the Chinese largely single young men who were here to uh, marry outside of their race, it basically created a generation of, 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 of forced bachelors. And so, you know, I note that it wasn't until the 1920s um, 
and 30s that we even saw a second generation of Chinese uh, Americans, right, the children of immigrants um, uh, kind of form. Um, so during this time period when the Chinese were basically uh, immigration was halted from China, this is where we start to see large scale immigration from Japan, um, because now we had these Japanese uh, men, uh, male immigrants come over to basically fill in a lot of ways the roles that were now left empty um, because of the exclusion of Chinese immigrants. Um, and so by by 1910, they now outnumbered the Chinese and they remained the larger uh, Asian American group until the 1960s. But similar to the same types of anti-Asian sentiment that we saw directed towards the Chinese, this same type of sentiment did um, uh, you know, occur uh, directed now towards the Japanese. Um, the reason why that there was no uh, Japanese Exclusion Act is because the president uh, you know, of America and the president of Japan, the emperor of Japan, basically came to what we call the Gentlemen's Agreement. And this was in 1907. Basically, that was a loophole that said that Japan on their end would slow down immigration um, from Japan so they wouldn't allow their citizens to immigrate to America, but it would, uh, with the exception of uh, women um, who, you know, were able to come over and join, you know, their, their, their male um, partners. And so for this reason, the second generation of Japanese Americans developed quickly, you know, unlike what we saw with the Chinese. Um, and so they numbered about half of the group by 1930. So this is significant because, you know, when we talk about or, you know, when we when we think about what we know about um, the Japanese being rounded up and placed in internment camps during World War II, you know, it's worth noting that the majority of those people rounded up were Japanese Americans. They were American citizens. They were people who were born here in America, who lived their whole lives in America, and were just of Japanese ancestry. And, you know, once again, in the same way that we have difficulty speaking about Native American culture as a whole or Latino culture as a whole, we similarly have trouble speaking about Asian American and Pacific Islander culture as a whole, because no two of these cultures are the same. Um, and there's a, a, a large amount of diversity. Um, but there are some similarities, as noted by cultural anthropologists. Um, Asian cultures tend to stress group over individual, so collectivism over individualism. Um, they stress sensitivity to the opinions and judgments of others, and they place great importance on not giving offense on, and avoiding uh, public embarrassment. Um, a lot of traditional Asian cultures are male dominated, um, but as your book notes, uh, experiences in the United States have modified this patriarchal values and traditional traits. So you are seeing, of course, uh, Asian American women um, going to college, pursuing higher education, and being in the labor force, you know, at rates that almost are at parity with, you know, their, their male counterparts. One thing that certainly comes up when you talk about uh, values associated with Asian Americans is education. Um, and, and people trace that back to, you know, um, among the Chinese and other Eastern Asian communities, you know, uh, them having a Confucian background where there is this tradition established by Confucius that you should strive for educational excellence. Um, there is a lot of parental support. Some might would even say parental pressure uh, related to education. And we see that reflected in things like the fact that Asian Americans, you know, have the lowest rate of high school dropouts. They have the highest rate of uh, post-secondary uh, education attainment. Um, but this stereotype of Asian Americans as being successful students, what sometimes leads to them being referred to the model minority, of course, is doubled edge, um, you know, because a stereotype, even when it's a positive stereotype, strips people of their individuality and allows them to kind of be regarded by a blanket assumption. Um, I'm going to come back to Asian Americans and the elderly. Actually, I'm not. Um, let me go ahead and address that right now. Another kind of value that we associate with Asian American cultures is respect and care for the elders. Um, and we do see that compared to the broader population, Asian American households are more likely um, to have um, to, to have an elderly member living in their household, to be living in the household of um, with their grandchildren um, compared to other groups. Um, 
I don't know, I'm still going backwards. And so, you know, all of this, you know, taken together just means that, you know, this is a group that, uh, you know, uh, has less families in poverty, um, doesn't have as many uh, births to unmarried women, and has a high rate of individuals with a BA degree and higher, and it has some of the highest rates of individuals that are foreign born. Uh, the article that I want you to read in association with this group has to do with the imagery of the tiger mom, right? Um, and addressing, you know, is there a thin line between a parent being supportive versus a parent being overbearing? And how the concept of tiger mom encompasses that kind of uh, debate um, around, um, you know, around that, that conflict. So uh, part three of this chapter deals with immigration. So this part that deals with immigration. Um, it's funny to me that we are the land of immigrants because if you actually look at our policies, if you look at you know old media clips and articles, if you you know look at old opinion poll data, you know we are a country, you know we're a land of immigrants that has historically been ambivalent or even downright hostile to immigration, um, and you can see this if you you know look at um, the conversation around the establishment of the national origin system, um, and so this was during 1921 to 24. Um, and basically, this was a quota system. Um, America was trying to limit certain people from coming to the United States. Um, you know, obviously, we didn't want any non-white groups at all, um, uh, uh, um, you know, coming. Um, but we also were trying to limit uh, certain types of white ethnicities as well. And that reflects the fact that, you know, when we say we're a nation of immigrants, a lot of people are associating that with what, what we call old immigration who were our original immigrants? Well, they were from places like England. They were from places like, uh, you know, France. They were from places like uh, Scandinavian countries and the Dutch and the Germans. And we were, we were pretty okay with those immigrants. But the later wave of immigrants who we call the new immigration, um, who started coming in the mid to late uh, 1800s and then really escalated their numbers um, at the start of the 1900s. Well, they were groups like the Irish, Italians, Eastern Europeans, particularly Jews, and America was a lot less welcoming to them. Um, and, you know, the fact that we now see all of those groups of people as being white today, you know, it's worth noting that that wasn't how they were originally perceived or treated. Um, there was prejudice and there was outright discrimination against those groups of people, uh, you know, in terms of their work opportunities as well as their living opportunities. Um, and what really changed our perception of them, um, you know, is related to when we finally abolished the national origin system, which was with the Hart Seller Act of 1964. Um, because this Immigration and National Act basically abolished the quota system said that was, you know, unconstitutional. Um, and it established the fact that, you know, we were gonna have this immigration system um, and it wouldn't be built around quotas. It would be built around um, two primary goals. One goal was to reunite families. So we were willing, we would bring over people that could, you know, prove that they had family already established here in America, as well as it was meant to protect American labor markets um, by allowing us to recruit and bring over uh, people um, for the labor force that we deemed necessary. Um, and so those were kind of the two primary goals. Um, but what's funny is in 1964, you know, with these new immigrants, you can kind of see that, you know, the type of people that began to now enter the United States were very different than before, where before they were primarily Europeans and Canadians. You can see beginning in the 1970s and then increasing, they increasingly started to come from places like Africa, uh, uh, Asia, uh, and Latin America, um, and the Caribbean. Um, and so the face of immigration changed quite a bit. Um, and, you know, 
once again, uh, as we've started to uh, admit more immigrants, people's attitude uh, towards immigrants um, or certain people's attitudes, the public sentiment towards immigrant um, once again has kind of veered into that ambivalent to hostile range. But what's funny is that, you know, Americans oftentimes have very strong opinions about immigration without really understanding the system. And it's worth noting that, you know, the system can change with each kind of con Congress in place. So at the time I'm talking about this, you know, it's probably no longer even perfectly accurate. But basically, we set aside a certain number of visas a year. Um, 675,000 um, is what it was at least a year ago. Um, and of those, 480,000 were set aside for family preference, and then 140 of those were set aside for employment related. Refugees is a separate system. Um, and it's worth noting that one thing that was a dramatic change and certainly contributed to the refugee crisis under the Trump administration was the fact that um, the ceiling for refugees went from being 110,000, which is what it was in the final years of the Obama administration, to 30,000 under Trump. And it's worth noting when I say ceiling, that, that means that that is the most we accept. There are plenty of years that where we accept significantly less than the ceiling. And people who are refugees are people who, um, you know, they present themselves at our borders and they claim refugee status on the basis of, you know, a variety of, of, of reasons um, that they are fleeing political persecution, uh, they're, they're fleeing, you know, political economic violence. Um, and we have this system set aside that when they present themselves and saying that they are, you know, seeking asylum, you know, it's supposed to trigger this process where they're admitted um, and they, you know, receive refugee status and that if they meet certain conditions that they can become lawful permanent residents after one year. Um, and, and then that puts them on track to, you know, gain citizenship. Um, and, and gaining citizenship is, is, is once again another process that, you know, the naturalization process that people are often not fully aware of, you know, that after you receive this visa, um, you have to wait five years um, to apply for citizenship. That can be cut to three if you have a U.S. spouse. Um, and then there's all this, this criteria when it comes to the citizenship in regards to, you know, you not having, you know, gotten in trouble with the law, having gainful employment and so forth. Even if you meet all that criteria, it's not free. Um, in 2019, when I updated this slide, for adult applicants, it was $725, 640 plus an $85 biometric fee. Um, then you pay that fee and you basically have to wait um, uh, and, and, and go through this interview process. Um, how long that wait is can vary based on where you live and how well staffed that office is. While five to eight months is typical, there are some places where it can be up to two years. During that interview, you take a test that ask you questions about United States history and civics. Um, I give you a sample study test there, but it's worth noting that the test isn't multiple choice. It is open ended. So you know this is a, the, you know the, the, this is a hard test. Um, if you don't pass that test, you have to, you know, go back and, and start the process all over again. So, you know, all of this just means there is a lot of work that goes into becoming a citizen and it's not necessarily a straightforward process. Um, a trend to watch that, that Cohen mentions is undocumented immigration because immigrants who come into America you know, not going through that visa or that refugee process are what we consider to be undocumented. Um, that's about one quarter of all immigrants. Um, they make up roughly about 5% of the U.S. workforce. And their children are 7% of our, uh, you know, elementary and secondary uh, school systems. Um, a lot of them have been in the country for a long time. Estimates say that about two thirds have been here for, for 10 years. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, they are uh, just contributing members of society. Um, that's part of what allows them to be undetected for such a long period of time that, you know, these aren't necessarily people that are, are getting into any type of legal uh, trouble. Um, 
But despite not getting into any trouble, you know, they are, of course, here without documentation, which does place them at risk of being deported. And that's one issue that we've had to confront as of as of recently, you know, is is dealing with uh, family separations, um, both through deportation, but also family separations uh, when people come to the border, um, you know, to to initiate the refugee process. Um, we have, uh, you know, broken up families. Families um, and 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 this does raise both a kind of constitutional crisis uh, as well as a moral issue, and this is certainly something that we're probably going to see Congress confront uh, in the upcoming uh, you know congressional session. And your book does talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the family uh, separations uh, during the Trump era. Um, and, you know, and, and, and like I said, a lot of that has, of course, to do with the fact that they were seeking asylum. So when people say they should enter the right way, it's worth noting the refugee process, that is the right way to enter. You present yourself at the border and you ask for asylum. Um, what changed, of course, was America's willingness to accept refugees and, you know, our process for uh, kind of um, addressing the, the refugee crisis at the border. Um, and, and so this is something that we are still in the process of having to address and fix. And Part of why I think America has always had this kind of ambivalence in regards to uh, immigration um, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, what we feel like as a nation of immigrants, you know, what we feel like should happen when people, you know, immigrate uh, here. Um, because from the very beginning in this country, we've been interested in, you know, how do we form a nation when, you know, people are coming from all over the world and they have these different nations, you know, uh, nations of origin. And so in America, there's always been this pressure to, you know, uh, participate in American society to blend in through this process we call assimilation. Um, and assimilation is, your book notes, the gradual reduction of ethnic distinction between immigrants in the mainstream society. We commonly refer to this as the melting pot. Um, and there was this uh, uh, disagreement, if you will, in among sociologists um, in the early to mid 1900s about to what extent has America been a successful melting pot. People who we refer to as assimilationist theorists, they pretty much agreed that Every nation, and including America, has turned out to be a more or less successful melting pot. People come in with different cultures and they blend into a new culture. Um, and, and, and this more or less has been successful. Um, around the 1970s, um, there, uh, you know, as the face of immigration changed, as we're coming out of the civil rights movement and the black power movement and the brown power movement and the red power movement, so many movements, uh, you know, there started to be a rise in what we call the ethnicity theorists. And their argument was, you know, the melting pot did not happen, right? The melting pot maybe happened if you're talking about the European sub-ethnicities, but the melting pot did not happen if you're talking about the non-white minority groups in, um, in, in our country. And that's because if you only look at the white ethnics, then assimilation seemed to be successful. And part of it is, is you have to study it by looking at the generations. That the first generation, you know, usually their ethnic culture was still very strong. And in a lot of cases, if you're talking immigrants, they were pretty poor. Um, and we call that the peddler generation. They come over, they work from their hands, they're still distinctly, distinctly ethnic. Um, but they have a child and their child is American and their child grows up with the advantages of being a white ethnic in America, like, you know, being able to attend school, you know, not having to worry about, you know, not being part of the landed gentry, you know, perhaps seeking opportunities in the military. And so, you know, the child may not go on to college, but they still establish a better lifestyle for themselves than their immigrant parent. We call that the plumber generation. 
And so when that second generation American then has their child and they are able to, you know, raise that child, you know, in a suburb somewhere, you know, with in a house with a white picket fence, if you have you, then that child has a much greater chance of going on into higher education and into a white collar professional job. And this has traditionally been seen as the generational trend that we associate with uh, you know, that we associate with, with American success. It's worth noting that when you substitute white ethnic for Asian American or Latino or, you know, or, or even African, if you're talking about African immigrant and not, you know, uh, native African Americans, then this trend tends to fall apart. It tends to fall apart around that second generation. And that's because the reality is, is they are now living life in America, not as a member of the majority group, but as a member of a minority group. And so that three generational uh, trend can perhaps take, you know, upwards of, you know, four to five generations. And so this, and, and then especially if you're thinking about with Latinos, but to a lesser extent, even Asian American Pacific Islanders, the fact that there's cultural rejuvenation means they, you know, maintain their ethnic identities and their ethnic ties uh, in a way that makes, the, you know, it be much more salient than symbolic. So that also kind of hinders this full assimilation into American culture. And so perhaps a better way of thinking about, you know, assimilation is to kind of break it apart into three stages. Um, and if you go through all three stages, you're fully assimilated. And it's worth noting that for a lot of groups, unless you're talking, like I said, about the white ethnics, full assimilation hasn't happened. The first stage, which is cultural assimilation, which we also call acculturation, which your book discusses, and it discusses it in regards to both consonant as well as dissonant acculturation. But it's worth noting that this is the stage that most immigrants do uh, do go through. You know, if when they're here in America long enough, they do pick up on the cultural patterns. And in a lot of cases, especially if you're talking about, um, you know, to use Cohen's uh, you know, to use Cohen's um, terminology, if you're talking about the one and a half and the second generation, they in particular almost always successfully uh, go through the cultural assimilation stage. The structural assimilation stage comes next and it's a little bit more difficult because now you have to penetrate the cliques and the associations of the core society at the primary group level. They have to be willing to accept you as colleagues, as neighbors, um, as, you know, fellow parents in the PTA. And that acceptance isn't necessarily, you know, it's not solely at your discretion. You can't make someone accept you. You know, all you can kind of do is try to convince them like, hey, I'm kind of like you. So structural assimilation, which also is called integrate integration, um, it is a little bit more difficult. Especially when, like I said, you are, uh, you know, part of a minority group and you're immigrating and you are perceived as being part of the minority uh, group and not the majority group. Marital assimilation means that there is significant immigrant Im intermarriage between you know, immigrants who share your nation of origin and the dominant majority group. Um, it's worth noting that, you know, once again, unless you're talking about the white ethnics, there is not been a group that has experienced that level of marital assimilation with the exception of some specific Asian sub-ethnicities like Japanese Americans. And particularly if you're talking about female Japanese, Japanese Americans um, and not in Korean, Korean Americans, not necessarily even uh, males. And so, you know, this all just raises the idea, of course, um, you know, if the ultimate uh, stage of the melting pot is we intermarry and we have babies, we reproduce and we produce these, you know, multiracial children, um, you know, has that been happening in America? Um, so this is the fourth part and the final part of your chapter, which is on intermarriage. So intermarriage is the marriage between members of different racial or ethnic groups. And as your book notes, is seen as the litmus test of racial and ethnic difference. Because when uh, the dominant group is, or when a group is willing to accept significant amounts of, of, of intermarriage 
um, between their group and another group, then that is kind of the kind of ultimate stamp of acceptance. And intermarriage is important in the sense that it allows for more interaction of extended families. It observes the acceptance of integration and difference. And so, you know, we use uh, we use uh, data related to intermarriage in order to help us understand, you know, what level of social acceptance exists among the dominant group or the majority group and our minority groups. Well, if we're looking at it historically. Um, we can pretty much tell that intermarriage wasn't accepted because there were so many laws on the books that prohibited it. The very first law was passed in Maryland in 1661. Um, and, you know, the focus really was on um, making sure that Black men did not intermarry and did not father children with white women, because it's worth noting that white men, primarily slave owners um, and overseers, they fathered many children with Black slave women, and they didn't really have to worry about their children, um, you know, being accepted by white society, because at the same time we had these laws against intermarriage, we also had the one drop rule, which pretty much said that these children were going to be seen as black regardless of phenotype and that their legal status if they were their mothers were slaves that their legal status was they were going to be slaves as well um so this th these laws were really concerned about you know uh about the relationships that could exist between black men and white women um and really if you're thinking about intermarriage this has always maybe been the most controversial pairing and your book talks about how in this country there's been a history of these types of uh, accusations being used as a way to flame lynch mobs, as being used as a way of 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 killing unknown numbers of of black men, and even within the legal system, even if 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 you know it wasn't an extrajudicial lynch mob, you know, oftentimes uh, being uh, found guilty of such an accusation would still result in death. But with these laws on the books, you know, it, it wasn't just, of course, you know, black men and white women, um, their marriages being regulated. Um, these anti-miscegenation laws, which have been on the books since 1600s, you know, pretty much prohibited the legal marriage of, of, of blacks and whites. In some states, there were also laws that prohibited marriages of people of Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, and Indian and Hawaiian ancestry. And some of those states that had those additional laws were states like Arizona, California, Georgia, Mississippi, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, Wyoming. So keep in mind, this is part of how we created that generation of, of, of Chinese bachelors. Um, you know, we wouldn't allow them to uh, bring over uh, their Chinese uh, significant others. And in a lot of states, we made it pretty much impossible um, for them to marry, uh, you know, uh, white women. And these laws were seen as legal and, and they were constitutional until the Supreme Court case of Loving v. Virginia, um, which was in 1967. And it basically said, these laws are unconstitutional because they infringe on a person's civil rights, that people have the fundamental freedom to decide who to love and who to marry. And Loving v. Virginia was, was, was made into a movie, um, a pretty good movie actually, a few years ago. And I'll give you a link if you wanted to check out that trailer. Post-loving, a lot of states kept these laws on the books, even though they were unenforceable. Um, and a lot, several states, they voted on whether to repeal the laws. And of course, keep in mind, this is, is this was just symbolic because you know they couldn't enforce these laws anymore but it sent a message really if you think about it to even have these types of laws on the book and so the last state to finally remove the laws was in Alabama and that was in 2000 and they did it by by vote and it's worth noting if you think it was just like a blowout you know well look the vote was pretty much 60 40 percent um, and so, you know, even in 2000, there were 40% of people in Alabama who thought that there should be a law on the books saying it was illegal for people to marry outside of their race. And, you know, and I, and, and that's really just kind of shows, you know, that the attitudes that exist um, among, um, uh, about intermarriage, they have changed. Um, but they haven't changed maybe as dramatically as one would like, and they haven't changed um, 
as dramatically uh, among some types of people as one would like. And there does still seem to be a stigma uh, to being African-American um, because they are the least likely to marry outside of their race, while there are other groups, for instance, like American Indians um, who have high rates of intermarriage. Um, so particularly for uh, people that identify as American Indian but don't live on reservations, they have a very high rate of intermarriage. And so your final required reading for this chapter um, was basically just a, a chapter that looked at the social trends um, around intermarriage um, as collected and analyzed by the Pew uh, research group. So, you know, check that out and just think about, you know, what does this research reveal about these interracial kind of marriage trends? And, you know, perhaps consider what you maybe foresee in the future. Keeping in mind that, like I said, in a lot of ways, people's willingness or unwillingness to marry outside of their race, to accept if their son or daughter um, or mother or father marries or remarries outside of their race, we do still foresee that as being a very good sign of, you know, to what extent um, have we achieved social distance, um, you know, or the level of social distance, which basically is the level of acceptance that members of one group have towards members of another group. And so that is it. Um, you know, uh, don't feel bad if you had to start and stop this video several times. I had to start and stop it uh, several times to even finish recording it. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, this was a pretty complete overview um, of your material uh, for chapter three of the textbook.